A stunning shakeup for Oregon State this week. The players will try to pick up the pieces after Gary Anderson resigns midseason. How will the team respond under interim head coach Corey Hall? And this week, a real chance to pick up their first Pac-12 win of the season against a Colorado team still trying to sort things out. What will it take? A brand new edition of Go Beavs starts now. Stadium and Beaver Nation getting set for an interesting showdown on Saturday. One with a new coach on the sidelines. Welcome into Go Beavs. Amanda Maynard, Jason Down at Peace, and Nigel Burton. So Gary Anderson and Oregon State parting ways on Monday, leaving the Beavers in kind of an interesting position. Still to come on the show, we're going to talk about what's to come at, against Colorado. And then, of course, we're going to get these guys' take on who might be the next coach for the Beavers. But, of course, tomorrow, first game without Gary Anderson. What do you expect we're going to see? Well, if you ask me, you're going to see an energetic guy on the sideline by the, way, by the name of Corey Hall. You know, <laughs> this is his first opportunity to kind of showcase himself and really get a chance to show, you know, the value that he brings to the table. And I'm sure he's going to get those kids fired up to prove themselves and prove that they can win. Yeah, I just think, one, I'm a little upset that I'm sitting next to this dude looking <laughs> like this with, like, the tie and everything. He, just, I he, doesn't, look, he doesn't like the fact that I look so good. That's what I'm like, I'm not sure whether to talk beaver football or order a sandwich. I'm this feels sure like the right Gary now. Anderson funeral. But, uh, I'm just right. making sure. Very okay. dark colors. Either way, uh, <laughs> you know, I think there's going to be a ton of emotion. I mean, honestly, you talk about everything with Corey Hall and the way he... He actually had a, a, a quote where he talked about he almost tore his Achilles jumping up and down. And he talked earlier this week about playing uh, for Coach Anderson and, and showing their love of Coach Anderson the way in which they play. The biggest thing I'm, I'm hoping that I also see, though, is a lack of the administrative penalties that we've seen throughout the season um, and making sure some of those things clean up. And, and really, I think you'll also see a re-emphasized uh, team in terms of the run game and stopping the run. I think those are some of the things that Corey talked about throughout the week. All right, well, in our Buster's Barbecue Q&A, we're getting the players' take on what they expect to come tomorrow. I didn't expect to go through it once, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, twice is pretty, you know, difficult. The first time was difficult. The second time is just as difficult. So, I mean, just got to, you know, keep pushing, keep playing football, you know, because that's what I was brought here to do, you know. Um, so, just keep, that's what they want me to do, just keep playing football. That's it. He was a great man. That's the reason why I came all the way out here. And he always going to look out for me. I'm always going to call him whenever I need anything. And we're we going to stay as a family. Yeah, all the above. Uh, you know, guys were emotional uh you know tears were tears were shed and and guys were upset and and it was hard to understand why this was happening at the time but uh you know we uh we you know came back together and uh and you know to talk to us and coach hall talked to us and and coach a was you know in there for a little bit as well just as that transition of him leaving going out and uh he uh you know wanted to make sure that 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 we understood um you know what was happening and 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 that we weren't just kind of left out to dry. You know, I think he did that. So again, all this going down on Monday, here's Gary Anderson's statement on waiving his guaranteed contract, which meant, again, leaving a lot of money on the table. He said, waiving my contract is the correct decision and enables the young men and the program to move forward and concentrate on the rest of this season. Now, I know we had a very heated debate on Wednesday's show about whether or not him, him leaving midseason was him quitting on his team. I know some people, that's been the perception. Players obviously don't seem to feel that way, or at least they're saying publicly that they don't. Um, how, do you, how do you view his, his departure midseason, and what do you think it's going to do for the, the remainder of the season? Like, Can this be a, a uniting force, and, and how do you get it to, to spin that way versus into a spiral? Yeah, you know, it, this is a really precarious uh, position uh, for the players because you know, they love their coach. They love GA um, being their coach. But at the same time, you know, this obviously was something really difficult for them. Uh, you know, reports have him losing 25 pounds, not being able to sleep. So you know that this was something that he, you know, was thinking about and kind of hemming and hawing about. Um, as the player, from the player side of things, if, if I'm one of the players, I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is difficult for him, but I want to show him what I'm made out of. Um, I personally wouldn't have wanted him to leave in the middle of the season. I would want to see him, you know, you know, play the whole season out, you know, continue to coach us and, and be there for us. But for me, uh, listen, 
It, it, it's hard because for him, I, I'm sure that he had a, a lot of issues there, and that's the reason why he walked away. But I want to have one that's even leave. Yeah, the biggest thing, can we move forward? Like, because here's the thing, like, obviously I've got a ton of respect for Gary Anderson, and I consider him not just a great football coach, but he's a friend. And at this point, I think this is a great moment. You know, uh, uh, Scott Barnes talked about resetting the football program. So here's what I'd like to see get reset to. All right, I grew up in a, in, in a place where football was taken very seriously. All right, uh, I, I always told my son, you know, his little peewee program, my peewee program was like Cobra Kai Dojo, right? Mo Mercy was for the week. We swept the leg, Johnny, all right? We put him in body bags, that's how it was. I'm serious. And then my high school, we were the worst team on campus. We were 12 and one. Then I got to University of Washington, we were expected to blow people out every single game. Yeah. I got to Oregon State University and there was an expectation there that was set by Mike Riley when he first walked in the door, Dennis Erickson took it to a whole nother level. We walked in the door and we were like, look, we need to win at least 10 games. That's how we viewed things. There was a, you ever remember walking into a stadium thinking like, Never. geez, you hope Never. we win? Never. And, and that's the biggest thing for me is that, like, listen, as the head coach of the football team, like, you want your players to have that, that fight in them already. You shouldn't have to coach that. You shouldn't have to push the, the agenda uh, in terms of that. And some of these players don't seem to have it, if you ask me. And, and I'm not dogging the players. I'm just saying at this point, can somebody please, from the, starting with Scott Barnes, actually starting with Ed Ray, but I'm not sure it's going to happen with Ed Ray. It needs to start from Scott Barnes to whoever he brings in, or if Corey Hall ends up getting the job, and that's what I'm really excited about this weekend, is that whole attitude, that golly gee, I hope we can compete, like, let's try to keep it close. All that stuff's got to go away. Yeah, I am right. tired of seeing that because that was a proud place, man. I was a, I'm was, i proud of that I was a part of Oregon State. I'm, that's why I consider myself, I said it on the Patrol Nowhere, I'm a Husky beef. Like, and I didn't go to Oregon State, but I was proud to be a part of that program. And we walked in the door there, we were like, look, we're going to knock you in the teeth. LSU, you're defending national champs? Well, defend the national this. Yeah. We're about to smack you all up and down this place. And that's the attitude, that's the swag that this that it's missing right it's now. Lacking. And it's not necessarily because I know that that Gary had that. And, and that comes from winning. And you gotta come back and you gotta win and you have to have that attitude. But it's gotta start from the top down. And it's gotta everything about that place to me has gotta go back to what it was. And in order to go back to what it was, it can't be this golly gee, I hope we can compete. Let's get some division three dude in here. Like, nah, forget all that. This yeah, is a big time work. place yeah. and treat it as such. Yeah. All right. Much more to come here on the show, including revealing the winner of our offensive matchup in a best damn bracket. But coming up next, we dive into the deep pool of coaching candidates. Which ones may realistically come to Corvallis? How hard is it down there? I mean, he just expressed a lot of frustration, and they've had some, you know, issues with locker room funds getting on the hold. And how hard is it? No idea. I really don't. I mean, I've been there. Focus got a great job here and a uh, great place. I really, I really don't know what it's like down there. They've gone for a while. Not really fair in the middle of the season for you, but your name's obviously come up naturally. You kind of expect that at this point, but yeah, uh, flattering at least. Or, I mean, sure, yeah. flattering. Got a, you know, obviously I got great memories there and whatnot, but it's got an extreme focus really on us in these next couple of practices. I thought we practiced really well today, and uh, the Sun Devils presented a challenge, and we got a lot of things going, and so it's a huge game Saturday. So Jonathan Smith staying mum on his name being circulated around for next head coach of Oregon State. What are you guys looking for as far as characteristics? Go. Well, someone who understands the Northwest because the Northwest is is one of those areas where you have to uh, you have to know the type of recruit is that you're going to have to have up there because it's so far removed from the rest of the country. But you also need someone who's even kill, who's going to have that that fight in them, that knows that they're going to have to be able to build up a program. Someone who's uh, a, a good recruit because in order to get people up to the Northwest, you have to have someone that knows where to go knows what to tell these kids, and just has that passion of bringing Beaver football back to where it once was. Yeah, um, I, I agree with some of what you said. I don't know if the guy, I mean, even kill, eh, I'd, I'd venture to say all coaches are a little bit off. <laughs> <laughs> Present coach. Including yourself. Yeah, uh, and I would also say, I think knowing the Northwest is way overrated. I, I, had, I recruited Northern California uh, until I got to Oregon State. And then I, Coach Riley said, hey, can you go recruit the Inland Empire? And I said, where? I don't even know what the Inland Empire is. I grew up in California, and all I did was I ended up pulling one of the best group of recruits out of the Inland Empire. Two years later, he said, now I want you to go recruit L.A. And I said, I don't know the difference between the 10, the 2, the 210, the, I don't know what you're talking about. 
but you find ways and there's a way to still recruit. You find who the stakeholders are. You find out who. So if somebody's not familiar with the Northwest, I don't think that's a big deal. You either have guys who know how to recruit. I think the biggest thing is you got to know how to evaluate. You can find guys who can recruit. The evaluation piece is the tough part because you got to be able to turn over rocks at Oregon State. You got to find guys. You're not finding that shiny gem, that 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 nice diamond that's already ready to go and put in, in and set it in a ring. Like that's not what you find at Oregon State. You got to find the guy who maybe is a little this, a little bit that, and then work with him and then turn him into that. And so you have to you have to be able to evaluate your guys. I think that's probably one of the biggest struggles the last couple of years is finding the right guys for your system. How, how challenging is it to win in Corvallis? Because I know, again, as this has happened this week, some people have said, okay, it's one of the worst jobs in the Power Five. Uh, you mentioned, again, developing guys, that's going to be key. What are some of the other challenges you face in Corvallis? Well, it's the only game in town, number one. So you have a lot of people, you have a lot of alumni, a lot of people that, you know, they're looking at Oregon State on a day-to-day -day basis, looking to see how well they're doing, how well these kids are developing, how well they're able to compete. And if you don't get that, right away or get at least a, some of that then it's going to be you know you're going to be the talk of the town and people are going to start to grumble here and there and then also um you have to have the the support from the rest of the the university you know we all know that they were one of the final teams in the pac-12 to really take that money and then also uh you know develop some of these uh facilities so there's some of that that goes along with that too so you know where you're at at Oregon State. Yeah, here's the problem. You're competing with some of the best universities in the country. So one, academically, you can't say that you have the number one public institution in the United States like Cal and UCLA can say. You don't have facilities like Oregon. State, like Oregon. You don't have uh, a recruiting base like you do in LA or maybe in the Bay Area. And so all those things work against you. It makes it a tough job. I'm not going to say it's one of the worst jobs. It makes it a difficult job, but one in which you can be successful and history has proven that. All right, on for the on to the coaching candidates. Uh, we're going to hear from Lindsay Schnell on who she's hearing circulating. Person that makes a lot of sense to me, too, in fact, are Alex Grinch, the current defensive coordinator at Washington State. He's probably one of the hottest names of, in the coordinator ranks right now across the country. A lot of people are going to make a run at him. He's had success at Washington State, the place that is most comparable to Corvallis uh, in the Pac-12. And then Bo Baldwin, currently the offensive coordinator at Cal, who, of course, Oregon State fans remember because talk about a man that can recruit quarterbacks. He did that very, very well in eastern Washington. But two other names I want to throw out there. How about Bronco Mendenhall? He's an Oregon State alum. He's at Virginia right now. He's proven that he can win there, obviously. Proved he could win at BYU before that. I don't know if he wants to come home, but I think he's an interesting name. And I say this somewhat jokingly, but mostly not. The George Fox to, Corval to Oregon State pipeline has worked really, really well. What about Chris Casey? the brother of Pat Casey, the baseball coach. Chris Casey won a lot of games as a high school football coach. He understands the state as well as anyone. And now he's revived a completely dormant program at George Fox. That was Lindsay from Talking Beavers this week, breaking down her ideal coaching candidates. Uh, Nigel, well, I first want to ask you a little bit about Lindsay's. I, we already know how you feel about the George Fox to Corvallis Pipeline. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's like that worked really well. I mean, unbelievably well for women's basketball and for baseball, but this isn't women's basketball and it's not baseball. I mean, you're talking about the cash cow. You're talking about the program that basically earns the money so that a lot of other programs can exist. And so um, I would venture to say, no, I would not go in that direction. What about yeah. Alex Grinch? You know, because that's I know a name that you guys didn't know. We're gonna get to your choices, but what do you think about that one? I mean, he, he's a recognizable person, you know, being a D coordinator for Washington State. But I don't think he carries with him a big enough name. You know, I think you need someone that has a little bit more, you know, rec like I don't know, that's more recognizable in order to bring in some of these recruits that you're going to need within these next couple of years to redevelop this program and get it to where it once was. And I don't think Alex Grinch is necessarily the person that could get to that level. And I think the success is a small window. I mean, let's not get caught up in today and forget about last week. So, <laughs> you know, Alex has done a really, really good job at, Oregon, at Washington State. Don't get me wrong, but two years ago was a different animal. 
and last year they were solid but not great. This is the first year they've made a major move. So if this if this had happened three years from now and that trend that he's having now continued, I think it's a different conversation. All right, Jason. So who are your coaching choices? If you're on the committee, who are you picking? So there's three names specifically that, that I like. Uh, Jonathan Smith happens to be one of those. Okay. Um, and the reason why I chose Jonathan Smith is because he has the he's an Oregon State former alum. I uh, was a, one of the greatest quarterbacks to play for the university. Currently the co-offensive coordinator at Washington, so he's had success up there. He knows the Northwest, he knows this area. Um, he has a recognizable name. The fan base would be energetic and energized to have him uh, as their new uh, head coach. Uh, Les Miles, everyone knows Les That's Miles. That's an interesting pick. It, it, huh? it is Mad interesting. Hatter. The media would it, it, love it, it, it Mad, right? Mad Hatter, <laughs> I, love, I love that nickname for him. You know, here's someone who has won a national championship before he won in 2007 with LSU. He has, uh, again, uh, he's recognizable. Players know who he is. Better tell him Boots. that you better not eat the grass at Oregon State. <laughs> <laughs> right, I like it's that, not yeah. real grass. <laughs> Don't eat it. Don't eat it. So, I mean, and again, you know, as Nigel has said before, um, he's not familiar with the Northwest. He's, uh, he's originally from Ohio, you know, uh, was uh, Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State before he went to LSU. But he has that name and that um, people know who he is, so he'll be able to bring in some, some big time recruits. And then the third name that I had was Chris Richards, who's a defensive coordinator currently at Seattle Seahawks. Okay. Um, and I like him because he's young, he's energetic. Uh, again, he's respect, people respect what he's done with the, uh, with the secondary there in Seattle. And uh, he's never been a head coach, and why not, why not Oregon State? So I'm gonna tease you a little bit, it's for Shard. But Richard, that being yeah. said, <laughs> you know who hosted him on his visit when he was coming out of college? Yours truly. I hosted oh, him at the University of Washington. Obviously, I did a great job because he went to exactly. USC. Exactly. So, <laughs> but either way, um, I like that list a lot. I think the only issue is, you know, Chris is going to be up for some NFL head jobs. Yeah. And I'm not sure he would step down to college. Love the Les Miles pick and, uh, and Jonathan Smith as well. Um, I think those would be good choices. Um, for me, I, I go back to what has been your formula for success? Your formula for success has been former NFL head coaches coming in because something has got to grab a kid from L.A., grab a kid from the East Bay, grab a kid from Texas and say, you know what, yeah, I'm getting recruited by guys a lot closer to home, maybe even better academic schools in Oregon State, but, man, I get a chance to go play for Jeff Fisher? Like, that dude was in the league for how long? Like, he's still got those connections. He can get me where I want to go. Bo Baldwin, uh, I, I would agree. I mean, look, he's shown his pedigree. The problem is Cal is struggling right now offensively, and that might be a tougher sell. I know I've got Marvin Lewis up there, and Marvin Lewis has a job <laughs> for now. Marvin's name has been on the chopping block for about three, four years. And what people don't know about Marvin Lewis, he's a West Coast guy. He played at Idaho State. He loves Idaho State. He goes back to Idaho State even now as a head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. And so not only does he understand West Coast, but he also understands small town living yeah. and what that's like and what that's about. And he has that name cachet when he can start to drop all the different guys that he's coached, all the different in that pipeline to the NFL. I think if you look with guys with ties, I like Brandon, Bron, uh, Bronco Mendenhall. I think it'd be really tough to get him to leave Virginia. Uh, Jonathan Smith, once again, we talked about. And the other one I like is Keith Hayward. I think you, he, Keith Hayward is a guy who's very similar to, to Corey Hall in terms of he's got that energy, that focus. You know, he's an uh, 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 unbelievable professional, but he also has better resume than Corey does in terms of having coached at Washington, having coached at USC, having coached at Louisville. And he also understands the offensive systems of Clay Helton and now Willie Taggart and Bobby Petrino and the defensive systems of Grantham and Jim Levitt. And so he's just been around enough that he can put some things together because ultimately the head coach, you're an administrator much more than a coordinator. Yeah. All right. Still a game to focus on this weekend as Oregon State gets set to host a very difficult running back, Philip Lindsay. Like I said, I'm 5'8", 193 pounds, and that's what you're going to get. You're going to get all 193 pounds of me and all 5'8 of them in the afro too. <laughs> and now to the break, Mike Parker giving us an update on how this team has responded to Corey Hall in its first few days on the job. Welcoming in Mike Parker from Corvallis. Mike, how do you feel like this team is going to respond to Coach Hall? I've liked the way they've responded already. I, I think there's a, after the team uh, got over the initial bewilderment and sudden shocking departure of their head coach, I think for them, football just became a focal point. Corey Hall's done a, a very good job, in fact, of just kind of rallying the guys to let's get back together, play for each other, have fun, 
make it as fun as possible. They're heading down the stretch. And in fact, uh, we had a chance to talk to Coach Hall just about how things have been going in these early days in his new leadership. I think it went well. You know, a lot of energy out there. Um, the boys, you know, just getting their feedback through our practice. They, they kind of, they, they, they love the energy, right? And they, uh, I'm, I'm proud of them because they came out here and they worked hard. Um, and they're focused, you know, they're focused. They're doing everything that we've asked them to do as a staff and couldn't be more proud. Again, I, I think a lot of it has to do for uh, what what they're doing it for and who they're doing it for. The walk through last night, it was, it was at first, you know, kind of somber, you know, but again, it, it finished on a high note, you know, and today we started on a high note and we finished on a high note. So um, the, they are responding well. I'm, I'm proud of the boys. I really am. And that high note that he talks about was evident. I've been going to a lot of practices over the years here, and the spirit, the intensity, the enthusiasm level, Amanda, was unbelievable to me. It reminded me of the 2000 team with energy after every play, guys fist, uh, chest bumping and running up to each other after big plays. Genuine enthusiasm. So I think that right now, and Coach Hall has done a tremendous job of getting everybody rallied up to make football fun again. And I think they almost feel a weight has been taken off of it. I think they're going to play fast and loose against Colorado. And, Mike, it wasn't that long ago that Clay Helton at USC was just the interim head coach. They removed that tag about two months later. Could we see a similar situation for the Beavers? You don't see that happen very often in the college football world, but it did happen. You're right, for Clay. I don't know whether it will, and I give Corey Hall credit for saying that's the furthest thing from his mind right now. I believe him when he says it. Corey Hall is a very genuine, uh, straight shooter, uh, a, a bullion kind of spirit, and I, I believe him when he says he's not thinking about, well, I'm going to make my run now and state my case. All I'm saying is I hope six, seven weeks from now that there's a sense of people saying, hey, what about Corey Hall? That means he's done a heck of a job and maybe tried to put himself in that Clay Helton category. And all this coaching drama aside, they still have a game to prepare for. Colorado uh, also looking for their first right. Pac-12 win. They came in with such high expectations this year. What's gone wrong for them? I think one of the key losses has been their defensive coordinator who moved uh, to another school, and namely the University of Oregon, and Jim Levitt, who's doing a very good job with that defense. He reinvented Colorado defensively last year. They're not quite as good defensively, even though Coach Elliott's doing a good job. They still have a tremendous core of receivers, four different guys with over 100 catches in their careers. That's unheard of in one roster, and a quarterback that hurt the Beavers badly in Boulder last year. They're not as good, but they still have a lot of talent with Philip Lindsay and those receivers and a quarterback that can hurt you both with his arm and his legs. So I'm not sure why they're 0-3. I know you have two ravenous teams for victory at Reser tomorrow. Thanks so much, Mike. We'll see you later in the show. And the Beavers have, may have some good news this week when it comes to Ryan Nall, the latest on his injury later in the show. And Oregon State's run defense will have their hands full this week. Up next, a closer look at Philip Lindsay. Here on Go Beavs, and Oregon State squaring off against an 0-3 Colorado squad tomorrow night in Pac-12 play. Ahead on the show, who may be back for the Beavers this week, plus the unveiling of who is moving on in our damn best bracket, and we'll hand out our ingredients to victory. Well, 2017 has had its ups and downs for Colorado just a season after claiming its first Pac-12 South crown. The defense dominated for the Buffs last season but lost eight starters and its coordinators this year. Mike McIntyre weighs in on the unit. It would be a little bit different, but we're, I kept the exact same system that uh, we had put in when uh, Jim came in. That's the system I wanted to run, um, and uh, we had run a very similar system when I was at the Cowboys and at the Jets. And I felt it worked better for all the spread teams. So I wanted to hire someone that would, was going to do the exact same thing. So very, very um, minimal change. We just lost some good players. We got to replace with good players. Players make plays. Players win games. Coaches can get them lined up and do all that stuff. But if you don't have good players, you can't win, period. And we had good players. And we'll have good players again this year. Just some will be a little bit wet behind the ears when they start. In our Toyota opponent preview. Again, Colorado losing eight starters on defense. They're three returners, fewest in the Pac-12. 
and they were torn up last week in their loss to Arizona uh, by the Wildcats QB Khalil Tate rushing for 327 yards second most in school history accounted for five touchdowns I know Daryl Garrettson is mobile but I don't imagine mobile. we're gonna see that kind of <laughs> performance but yeah I mean can there be parts of that formula that they can learn from oh absolutely uh, I mean Garrett's Garrison is not as mobile as as dynamic as Tate is but he does have he is a you know dual threat quarterback just like Tate so they could take like aspects of that and kind of formulate a recipe similar to what Arizona did but he's not gonna do what Tate did I mean he was playing out of his mind against I think them. many I mean, people I mean, will that, be that's a Tate did, right? game right there that's a yeah, career game yeah, yeah when I, I broke this game down and um, what really stunned me was now they really respected Khalil Tate's ability to throw the football here's what's not on that graphic right there he was 11 of 12 passing <laughs> for 143 wow. yards, in addition to running for 327 yards. So a lot of those big runs came on times when basically Colorado decided to play pass first. They were playing three on two. They were playing a version of, I don't know if you remember what all what we used to call it, either way. Anyway, it was cover four, and they had their li outside linebackers going and playing pass. The next thing you know, he's taken off. And so they were doing a lot of things. Then they went zero man and didn't respect the fact that, uh, that basically they could still run the read zone and he could keep, and there was nobody really left. There was a one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of one-on-ones left. Uh, with defensive ends in him, and he beat him. Now, Daryl Garrison is not that type of runner, and I would say if they want to put Colorado in those similar situations, they're going to have to show off Daryl's arm and those receivers to get that coverage to loosen up, to then try to get some of those run lanes opened up like what happened with Arizona last week. Yeah, and the thing about Tate, too, is that he rushed for all those yards with only 14 carries. I mean, I mean that, 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 that's <laughs> a huge run. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, a very I mean, long run. That's insane. Yeah. All right, well, on the offensive side of the ball, it's all about Philip Lindsay. The running back ran for 281 yards versus Arizona. Here's what his teammates had to say about him. Phil, one of the biggest things about him, he, he's just a big-time big, big time leader on the team. Uh, he cares about everyone on the team. He loves everyone on the team. And on top of that, he's a dang good football player. Um, he's quick, and he, he'll make you miss, and he's physical. So that's what makes him a good running back. And, you know, we guys like him on the team, we need him because not only is he a good player, but he's a leader. He's vocal, and he'll tell you what's what. And uh, that's one of the big things we need on our team, leadership. He's our Tasmanian devil. He's our heart and soul. He's our fire. Uh, he's an excellent player. Led the league in touchdowns last year and, you know, all-purpose yards, over 1,700 yards. And he's going to be the leading all-purpose uh, player in the history of Colorado football. So it's amazing what he's done for us, not only as a player, but as a leader, too. Well, there you go. Philip Lindsay, the Colorado all-purpose yards leader with over 4,900 all-purpose yards. Uh, you obviously have some pretty good running backs in this conference. Where does he fit into that conversation, though? I don't, I don't think he's in the top three. I mean, he is, he is pretty high up there. I mean, you still have, you know, Bryce Love, who's a Heisman hopeful candidate. You still have, you know, uh, Gaskin from Washington. You still have, you know, uh, uh, Royce Freeman from Oregon. Oh, I mean, there's I mean, some dudes. There's, there's, some, there's some, you know, I can keep on going Absolutely. on and on, but he's yep. definitely up there. I mean, he's he is dynamic. He definitely has, like, that scat back mentality, but uh, he's powerful for someone that size. They call him Tasmanian Devil for a reason because, he, you know, he rushes in between the <laughs> tackles. Um, I, might, I love his he, attitude. He might actually be one of my favorite players to watch. This dude, and, and, um, and I think I'm giving myself too much credit when I say he reminds me a lot of myself when I played in the Pac-12, is that I didn't care... I didn't have any concept of how small I was. Like, it really didn't. And when you watch him, he has no concept of his size. He runs people over. He yeah. jukes them. He straight arms them. In pass protection, he doesn't cut anybody. He tries to hit them right in the lips. Yeah. And when you look at it, I mean, he is, he gets every ounce of his talent. And you wish that other guys could play the way that he does. Now, when you're talking about running back play, I'm with you. I'd say Bryce Love, uh, Ronald Jones at USC, yeah. and Royce Freeman are kind of that top tier, top three. But I would probably say that he's next. I would put him on the same level with a Gaskin, uh, maybe a, a, a Kalen Balaj at Arizona State. And then you kind of have that Ryan Noll is kind of in there as well. And then yeah. the next group is probably, I'd say, Jamal Morrow at, at Washington State, you know, uh, uh, and Weary at Cal, and maybe a Nick Wilson at Arizona. So, and, and maybe even throw Stephen Carr in there, which is kind of cheating that USC has two yeah, guys. So, but, yeah. I mean, that's kind of where I think everything kind of shakes out. But he's definitely right on the edge of the, of the top three. I'm saying probably sitting four or five. Well, one of the things that I love about his, the way that he runs the ball, is his, I think he's perfected the jump cut. <laughs> like, like, I know, I know Evanson, yeah, sure. I know Evanson would, yeah. would love that. I mean, because he talks about that, like, with, with Ryan Nall. Right. I mean, he literally has 
has perfected that move, like the jump cut. I mean, there's so if you turn on his highlight, there's so many times that he utilizes that move to make uh, defenders miss. And I love that about him. So. All right. Much more to come here on the show. The debate into the best ever beaver continues with a matchup of some pretty good offensive players. The Rogers brothers, Ken Simonton, will reveal our winner. And will Ryan All be back this week? What to expect versus Colorado? But right now, we are taking a look at our standard TV and appliance headlines for the week. And we're starting with the bad news on the injury list. Take a look at the injury report. These injuries in the secondary are, are pretty crazy as you've seen them roll up. I mean, how much are you seeing this take a toll? You look at those numbers. No, numbers, those those names, it, there's, I mean, everybody's starts, out. Who's even left? Yeah, it, it starts to add up. I mean, you know, secondary-wise, and, and I kind of, you know, touched on this uh, for the last couple weeks, is that, you know, there's some really good receivers in this conference. <laughs> so, and, and and I'm saying that, you know, I'm not saying that lightly. I mean, they're... they're no, really that's not an understatement yeah, of the year. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Nobody was, anybody so, took it lightly ain't watching. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, for you to have all those cornerbacks, you know, hurt, like who plays? Yeah, I mean, I right? Mean, like, seven. I can't Xavier, I'm counting them all. So yeah, okay. I mean, well, it's, it's ridiculous. Seven total. And I mean, like you have, you know, Xavier Crawford, who started off this year as a freshman All-American. Um, he's been struggling the whole year, but you know, he's been one of their better corners that they've had. Now he's hurt. He's out. So who's going to cover these receivers? You know, so it's a big problem. It's a big issue. Yeah, so I don't know what you do. When your backups are getting hurt, that's that's a problem. You know, yeah. Mark Banker used to always tell me. Uh, I used to always wear on him like, bro, like, we got to change these reps up because my guys are getting killed in practice. And he's like, they have to see things as many times as possible so that they don't end up getting beat by them in, in games. And so they have to see every route combination, every way that a guy will lean, every, as much as humanly possible because otherwise you're swapping the next guy in yep. and he's got to learn the same stuff that the previous guy already got beat by. So you got beat by China, a new guy comes in, you get beat by a smash, a smash corner combination. Yep. You know, now they, the slant goes across the guy's face, you coach him up, now he's not getting beat across the slant, new guy comes in, slant's getting beating him across yep. the face. And you're losing your mind and pulling your hair out, which is why I only have this much <laughs> and it's just because a new guy is coming in and he has to learn the same lessons that the guy who's now standing on the sideline in a sling or on some crutches or bandaged up had to learn and now it's a whole new process and so that's the tough part and then you look at the crew that they got to play this week I mean come on yeah which speaking of which do you feel like this Colorado we'll take a look at the the numbers for this Colorado receiving crew uh, and you can see there's obviously been drop off but they go into Pac-12 play uh, you know obviously challenging against Washington UCLA Arizona are they for real or are they fake news? Well, I, I think they really depend upon, you know, Philip Lindsay for a lot these last couple games. So, and he's been playing off his mind too. I mean, his all purpose yardage has been, you know, piling up each and every week. I mean, he had 281 yards. I think it was last week rushing the ball. So, um, they, they, they've really depended a lot on him. But all the injuries that uh, right now in the secondary for OSU, I think what that tells you and dictates is that it's probably gonna, they're going to probably play a lot of zone coverage. They're probably not going to play a lot of man or not a lot of cover zero uh, or cover one. So uh, if you're playing zone coverage like that, I think you have the ability to kind of cover up some of those uh, injuries a little bit. So we'll see what ends up happening. Yeah, I, I think it, there's that's one issue. I think Steven Montez has been a little consistent is another issue. Playing against the University of Washington in that secondary, that's an issue. And then I think a lot of their numbers are down too because more guys are playing. Sure. I mean, uh, McIntyre's son's not on that list. You've got McCullough who stepped up. You've got Dunstan, Canty. I mean, they, they're Goodson. They're playing a bunch of different guys there as well. And so the ball's just getting spread out more than you've seen in the past when, you know, as they call themselves the Blackout Boys, when it were really, it was just Shea Fields, Bobo, and Ross. And now it's spread to more guys, and so the ball's just getting spread around more. Yeah. Okay, and our third topic, possibly some good news for Beaver Nation. Ryan Null upgraded to questionable. Do you imagine he plays this week, and what do you think we'll see? Yeah, uh, I, I, think he'll I think he'll definitely play this week. Yeah, you know, no they, need him, they need him to play this week. You know, I mean... Uh, at, at this point in time, um, you, they're going to run the ball. We all know that they're going to run the ball um, because who's behind the center. Uh, you have AP and you have uh, Tyner still. But this is the perfect opportunity for uh, Ryan Nall to make his presence felt once again because he still has not really done that this year. 
and really come out and have a good game against Colorado. So he definitely plays. Yeah, there's no question that Ryan Nall plays. Matter of fact, ran into him in the hallway. He gonna play. Uh, <laughs> he's got the uh, he's walking around with a brace on just to kind of protect himself. But he'll play on Saturday. I think you're gonna see a steady dose of Artavis Pierce and Ryan Nall okay. all day long yeah. if Corey Hall gets it the way that I think he wants it. Yeah. All right, still come. We're handing out our ingredients to victory. But first, Ken Simonton going head to head with the Rogers brothers. Who's still in contention to be crowned the best player in Oregon State history? Stick around. Plenty of Oregon State coverage each and every week. Talking Beavers airs Tuesday at 7 p.m. next week. And Inside the Huddle Thursday night with a special guest, Mark Banker. What? Time to check out our what? damn best bracket. Here is a look at the offensive side of the bracket. This week's matchup between Ken Simonton and the Rogers brothers. And the winner is, who's it gonna be? Oh, it's wow. Ken Simonton. What? Wow. Oh, it was close, at least. Uh, yeah, you guys really, uh, you were surprised by this one, weren't you? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, listen, when I came, when I came to Oregon State, uh, Ken was a uh, senior. And to me, you know, he uh, pretty much was the epitome of what Oregon State was all about. Like a hard, super hard worker, kind of, you know, wasn't someone who he felt that should have gotten the respect that he deserved. And he worked his tail off. He worked his butt off. I mean, his senior year, if he would have rushed for 1,000 yards, he would have been only the fifth player in NCAA history to have rushed for 1,000 yards each and every year. So when, it, when I remember that and I look at and I look at his history, I'm like, oh, yeah, Kenny, definitely, for sure. Yeah, he, he, he's a man. But then you go on to James Rogers, and for, first of all, the Rogers brothers together. Yeah, yeah, I mean. That's I mean, not fair. Yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> but you know what's funny is, like, the fact that, that those guys are on the list, because I think James really represented what Oregon State football became, because I'll never forget Lee Hull and I are in the lunchroom. We walk through. There's a kid sitting on this couch. He jumps up. Hey, coach, nice to meet you. My my name is 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 James Rogers. I'm like, oh, okay, kid. Yeah, you know who this is? No, no, okay. Well, what do you play? I play wide receiver. Play a little bit of DB. He's like, oh, okay, cool. So we walk around the corner, and Lee's looking at me like, man, he's playing for you. I was like, screw you. He's playing for you. <laughs> like, I'm not taking his little butt. We walk into Mike's office. We're arguing back and forth. Mike ends up saying, well, I said, Mike, he can't play DB in the Pac-12. He's too little. We're dealing with six foot two receivers. Well, Mike goes, okay, fine. He'll play wide receiver. Lee wants to fight me that day. Well, all of a sudden, we're in the first day of camp. He takes a little slant route, straight arms, half the defense, scores outruns everybody. Lee looks at me and goes, ha I got you. So, I mean, James was an awesome dude and stood for everything our program was about. So, I have a quick question real quick. Did you really talk like that? Yeah. <laughs> I, love I love the impersonation. How you doing, coach? My name is James Rogers. I was like, oh, what? See, I have an accent, a little bit of an accent, but that's, a, that's yeah, an accent. Exactly. That's yeah, an accent. Well, playing for sure. All right, turning to the defensive side of the bracket, our matchup for this week is Bill Swancutt versus Stephen Paya. To discuss the duo, we're bringing in Mike Parker from Corvallis. Mike, what do you think? Thanks, Amanda. Goodness gracious, what a matchup this is. I'm not going to probably fall on one side or the other because I called every game that these guys played in a Beaver uniform on the radio. Bill Swancutt, a force, the all-time sack leader and record for uh, tackles for loss, was unblockable in a lot of games. A young man out of Sprague. Stephen Paya was also at times just a relentless, a back-to-back -back defensive player of the year, defensive lineman of the year in the Pac-12. Paya, in one game against Washington State, just absolutely could not be blocked. So we're talking about two of the greatest forces defensively in Oregon State history. This is a tremendous matchup. I'll let the fans decide, but you can't go wrong with either Phil Swancutt or Stephen Paya. And onto our Facebook page. All right, guys, who wins? Wait, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> did, 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 did Mike Parker just say that he can't decide? He, he can't decide. How, how many times has he done that? He I love you, Mike, by the way. I love you, uh, Mike, but uh, come on. Uh, come on, okay. To he me, loves everybody. <laughs> yeah, he loves everybody, but come on. Make a decision, make a decision, uh, please. Can we, can we just play what, what, what Jay's reaction was when he said that he was... I, actually, there, this is a family this show. This is a family show, so what I said. Yeah, no. I'm just saying close. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not close. close. It's Swanee. Yeah, He's from funny. the state of Oregon. Funny. Like he had some epic moments. Yeah. I'll never forget him standing on the bench in the fog bowl. We beat the snot out of the ducks. And then, ah! Like, oh, that's are you kidding me? <laughs> Deep my head. I think said three things when he was here. Hey, like, and that's giving him one extra. Uh, Swanee's gonna hate me for this, but we used to call him Shrek. 
That's enough to vote for him. Uh, uh, I mean, but, yeah. well, come on, yeah, it's not close. He's the all-time leading sack leader for... Uh, You're for, not going to, like, give the reason his... you called him Shrek? Uh, you, his head. Oh, okay. That's Shrek, it, though. Okay. Like the ears. Right. Anyway, 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 anyway. Yeah, so, Swanee, all-time leading sack leader, uh, you know, won the Morris Trophy Award uh, for Pac-10, you know, best defensive player, uh, defensive line player, so, yeah. Swanee. Yeah, this, this, is, this might be, like, 99 to 1. <laughs> like, it might, like, the only person who's going to vote for Steve is if His Steve's mom, mom finds mom. out. <laughs> that she so, yeah. That's it. I All love right. Steve. That's great. <laughs> More to come on the show. Swanee. Right now, Evanson's getting you ready for the game at the OSU Beaver Store. Here we're at the OSU Beaver Store on campus. I have this awesome rain jacket from Columbia. Keeps the rain off you. Obviously, you know with the fall weather, it's going to be raining a lot. So you got to stay nice and dry at the football games. And then we have the nice Omni Heat jacket right here for the ladies. The awesome new technology from Columbia. Keeps the heat in. Lightweight. Don't have to put too much material on. Get all your gear more at the OSU Beaver Store. Fans start here. Oregon State getting set for their first game under Corey Hall. How will they respond? And what will it take to beat Colorado? Well, time now for our Ingredients to Victory, brought to you by Papa John's. If the Beavers score a touchdown in the game, you win the following Tuesday with Touchdown Tuesday. Just use the promo code BEAVER7 for 50% off your online order. Jason. Yes. What are your ingredients? <laughs> All right, so the first thing that they have to do is they have to uh, shut down or slow down, I should say, Lindsey, because uh, you're not going to be able to shut him down. So they're going to probably give him the ball 20 to 25 times. Uh, so you have to be able to slow him down, number one. Number two, offensively, you have to score touchdowns and not field goals. I can't even remember the last time that Oregon State was able to score a touchdown that wasn't in the fourth quarter. I mean, it's been, it's been a long time. So, uh, so that's the second thing. The third thing, and lastly, is that you have to come out strong and passionate and with a fight in you, right? I mean, like, show and prove what you're made out of and just be aggressive. All right, Nigel. Yeah, look, scoring touchdowns in the first half might also have to do with the fact that you played at the Coliseum and against the Huskies. So, yeah, yeah, yeah they're pretty good. Um, one, you've got to be able to run the football. I think Corey Hall is going to put a reemphasis back in the run game offensively. Two, just like you said, got to slow Philip Lindsay down. I don't know if you can stop the little dude because he is a monster. But if you could just slow him down, I would say keep him around three yards uh, per. Uh, per year, you know, three yards uh, per carry. I would say that'd be a good day at the office. And then don't shoot yourself in the foot. The Beavs seem to have these moments where they can get themselves back into games, get takeaways, whatever, and then it'll be a holding penalty, or they'll get a they'll get a, a unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, or somebody will jump off sides, and then they have to settle. Those are the things that have to stop if you want to win this game. You think this one's close? Heck yeah! Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there's going to be a ton of emotion. Hopefully, the fans get behind them. I think something great could happen on Saturday. All right, we'll see you next week.